my name is Jordan Bunting, and I'm research faculty at Oregon State University in the Department of Food Science and Technology. More specifically, I'm at the Food Innovation Center, where I work as a food scientist on the process and product development team, uh, and I help entrepreneurs develop commercial food products here. And so during graduate school at OSU, I studied the effects of genotype and environment on organic naked barley composition and food functionality. Um, and that was within the cereal chemistry lab led by Dr. Andrew Ross and in collaboration with Dr. Bridget Mainz and Dr. Pat Hayes from the Barley Breeding Research Group. And so today I'll be presenting the key findings of our research and sharing my experience with working with barley and cooking and baking. Uh, so here's an overview of what I'll be presenting today. I'll start off by giving some context to the research and then do an overview of barley as it relates to food quality, as well as highlighting the main challenges that food barley faces. From there, I'll cover the research we did on barley food quality and cover the main takeaways of our research. Then I'll finish up with some outreach work we did to highlight how versatile, versatile barley can be in cooking and baking. Then we'll move into a question and answer session. Uh, so let's get started. So to start off, to give some context, the research being presented today is just one small segment of a larger grant project being done in multiple states with other collaborators from Cornell, the University of Wisconsin-Madison, the University of Minnesota, and UC Davis. This research was funded by the USDA under the Organic Agri Agriculture Research Extension Initiative which aims to breed crops specifically for organic farming systems in order to support organic growers, gardeners, processors, and consumers. The aim of this overall grant is to develop varieties of organic naked barley that can be utilized in multiple end uses, such as for animal feed, malting, and for food, which is then where my research comes into all this. Uh, so just starting off with some general like anatomy and nutrition of barley. So barley can be divided into three main regions. You have the outer most layers, which is the bran layer. Just underneath that, you have the majority of the kernel, which is the endosperm. And then the last region is a smaller section uh, called the germ, which is the embryo of the plant. So when you plant it, it's this germ layer that will sprout to become the new barley plant. And so how that relates to the nutrition of barley. Um, you have a range of phytochemicals in barley, some of which are the vitamins. So the vitamins in barley, it's mostly a range of B vitamins as well as vitamin E. And then you also have minerals, mostly potassium and phosphorus, and some calcium and magnesium, and some other trace elements as well. And then so, those phytochemicals are largely concentrated in the bran um, and within the germ. So typically the outermost layers of the grain is where you find all these phytochemicals. And then you have your fiber, um, which is also largely concentrated in the outermost layers, uh, in the bran layers. But then you also have a fiber called beta-glucan in barley, and that's spread out through the whole kernel within the endosperm. Uh, there's fat in barley and grains in general, but it's very minimal, and that's um, usually concentrated within the germ. Uh, you also have protein, and that's going to be distributed throughout the bran and the sperm and the germ. And you, the, by far, barley is mostly starch. Well, grains are mostly starch, and that is concentrated throughout the endosperm, which is the majority of the kernel. And just comparing barley to some other cereals, just like a quick overview, um, barley has the highest fiber content, closely followed by rye. Uh, those rye and barley in general have like the highest fiber content of, out of all the grains. And then followed by uh, wheat and rice and corn, some other grains, but barley and rye are typically always at the highest. And so most of the barley produced today is actually not eaten by humans, but we think much more could be because it is a highly nutritious grain and maybe the best source of the fiber, like I mentioned, beta-glucan. 
uh, barley with adhering holes seen on the left image is known as covered barley. Most of the barley bread today is covered barley, which is bread specifically for malting and animal feed. Uh, this hole has a papery texture though, and it isn't pleasant to eat at all. So to make covered barley palatable, the hole can be abraded off, uh, resulting in pearled barley, which most people tend to be familiar with in the grocery store, and that's seen in the center image. Um, even though the pearled barley looks like whole or entire grain, it, it's not. This is because it is missing almost all of the bran and likely missing the germ as well. Naked barley, or also known as holeless barley, is a type of barley where the hole doesn't adhere to the kernel and threshes off during harvesting and cleaning, which is seen on the right. Since naked barley doesn't require purling to become palatable, it is preferred for food. When used in its entirety, naked barley is a whole grain. And since naked barley doesn't need to be purled, food products made with whole grain naked barley are also more nutrient dense than those made with pearled barley or refined barley flour. And so moving on to various components within the barley kernel itself. So not only does naked barley have the benefit of retaining all the vitamins and minerals routinely lost in purling, but naked barley also retains the outer layers of the grain where color pigments are stored. So the various colors in barley are due to the presence of compounds called um, either anthocyanins or, and melanins, depending on what exactly you're seeing which can function as antioxidants in food that may have a role in health promotion. And so starting with the picture on the left, you can see just a general range of the colors barley can come in, where it can be like this grayish blue, you can have black uh, to purple and to varying shades of brown. And to the, the second image, just to the right of that, is a uh, black, flakes barley, but the significance of this is that these flakes have actually already been boiled or they've been cooked and it, it still retains its black color, which is pretty unique when it comes to the colored barleys. Like if you cook purple barley, it tends to go varying shades of like darker brown, but the black holds up really well um, from cooking and baking. And then to the right of that is a uh, it's a, a loaf of bread, but it's mostly barley. Well, it's 40% barley flour, the rest being wheat flour. And you also have a black barley um, porridge folded into that. And this has already been baked. So this is a finished bread and it still retains all that black color, which is just a unique feature, I think, for the black barleys. And then just to the right of that, you have different batters made from barley. So the batter in the top left is made from a purple barley. So it's kind of like a pink, a pink tint to it. Um, the black barley really comes through and it's like a charcoal gray kind of batter. And then below that is your average, um, like cream yellow colored type barley uh, in a batter. And like the benefits of using the different colored barleys is it gives chefs and bakers a more opportunity to highlight the uniqueness of um, barley especially with the, the different colors that you normally don't really see in, in wheat or in other grains. And now for protein. So the issue of protein quality in barley is commonly brought up within baking communities because barley and wheat are closely related to each other, but have very different baking behaviors and just dough handling behavior. Um, so the picture on top is made just from wheat it's just a wheat bread and you can see it resembles wheat bread and it's aerated, has air pockets. It'll be much more lighter in texture. Um, but then on the bottom, you have that barley loaf I just previously showed. So this barley loaf, again, is 40% black barley flour. And then it was 20% black barley porridge folded into it. But there's still 60% of the flour is wheat flour. So it does have wheat in it. Um, but you can just see the dramatic difference once you start including more barley into a wheat-based dough, the progressively more dense it gets. There are some like dough handling tricks to try to increase volume, but in general, um, the barley gluten is different than the wheat gluten. The thing is, the gluten in wheat is known to trigger celiac disease. 
Um, but since barley is closely related enough to wheat that the gluten in barley also triggers celiac disease, and the same case goes for rye. Um, but the barley gluten, while it is closely related to the wheat gluten, it's not close enough to where you can form that gluten network to entrap air that wheat is so well known for. And so that's what's responsible for this behavior of triggering, triggering celiacs, but it doesn't have the properties of wheat gluten. And so in terms of like dough handling, um, as you increase barley flour, just like for the bakers listening, um, it, the doughs will be more difficult to handle. I recommend starting out with like maybe 10% barley flour if you've never used barley, just to see how that behaves in, a, in like a wheat dough. Just expect as the more barley you incorporate, it's gonna get a bit more stickier. It might hold its, uh, it won't hold its shape as well. Like when you do the normal dough shaping, um, and then once you start going near 40% barley, once you start going past 40, like above 50, that's when it becomes very, very difficult. So generally 10 to 40 for flour. In my personal experience, flour is by far the most difficult application for barley, as opposed to like whole grains or like flakes, something like that. Um, personally, I like using barley in like small percentages, like five, 10% for like scalding, which is where you cook the barley flour within water, like in a pan to make this like thick paste. Or alternatively, you can cook uh, flake barley into a porridge and then you fold that into a wheat dough, that uh, an already developed wheat dough. So you, there's already gluten in the wheat and then you fold in the cooked barley portion and then what essentially that does, you get the benefit of having this light aerated wheat-based dough, but you also incorporate the barley flavor throughout the, um, the whole bread and increase the fiber content. Um, so that's just like a personal opinion of mine. And then also makes the crumb more moist and it lasts for longer. And it gives like the crumb a more like custardy type texture. It's, yeah, it's great to me. Um, there are some other methods that people have worked on, like working with non-gluten containing grains. So you, you could hydrate barley and wheat flour separately from one another and then develop the wheat dough and then fold in the barley. And that could help with getting some more volume, but ultimately, no matter how much barley you're at, you're going to have like a denser crumb structure. But there are some techniques people have developed to get try to get around this issue. And then since barley is not really that well studied in terms of food, there's so many unknowns when it comes to protein quality in barley, especially when you compare it to what is known for wheat protein quality. Um, so most of the, F, the, F, the research efforts or efforts on food barley are actually highly focused on fiber. And so this is uh, beta-glucan. Uh, the primary nutritional reason barley is valuable in food applications is because of its high fiber content. More specifically, the soluble fiber in barley known as beta-glucan, which is what is stained blue in this image of a cross-section of a barley kernel. Beta-glucan is known to be protective against heart disease and diabetes. So there's an ongoing public health effort to encourage people to eat more barley. The remaining component of barley uh, makes up the majority of the kernel, which is uh, starch. Uh, well over half of barley is composed of starch. Uh, starch itself is composed of two components called amylose and amylopectin. These two components can come in varying ratios to each other, uh, in which this ratio determines starch type and ultimately influences cooking and baking performance. Uh, now there are multiple classes of starch type uh, but there are two main types in barley, which are non-waxy and waxy. Uh, non-waxy starch is on average around 25% amylose and 75% amylopectin, while waxy starch is closer to 0% amylose and nearly made up of all amylopectin. Different starch types of barley also vary in the, in the amounts of their beta-glucan content. Uh, non-waxy barley, 
typically has lower amounts of beta-glucan, while barley bread for waxy starch has more beta-glucan. These differences lead to different starch types having different properties and will influence cooking and baking properties as illustrated in the pictures. Um, so the picture on the top is a non-waxy barley. Picture on the bottom is a, made with a waxy barley. These are two batters. 200% uh, hydration, so one part flour, two parts water. So both of these samples are at the same hydration, but you can just see how wildly different they are. The waxy absorbs way more water. It's way thicker. It doesn't even drip off that fork that it's on. And so imagine making a pancake batter at home with one barley and then getting a new barley with a different starch type, and you'd be shocked to see how different these barleys behave. They are wildly different. And then this plays into some of the challenges of using barley today. There's this public health effort to encourage people to eat more barley as a source of fiber. However, using barley in food products uh, can be more challenging than just adding barley in a product to increase its fiber content. For example, if you were to replace a fraction of wheat flour or barley flour in a bread formulation, uh, this may cause multiple changes, such as denser crumb structure, like I talked about, uh, darker colored products, and may make doughs more difficult to handle and process. There's also the major challenge that what constitutes food quality and functionality for barley is not defined in a systematic way beyond the covered and holeless and waxy and non-waxy uh, starch classifications. For example, weak uh, wheat can be classified in multiple ways, such as soft white winter or hard red spring, which is often tied to wheat functionality as well, such as some wheat being better suited for pastries, while others may be better suited for breads. However, this type of classification system doesn't currently exist for barley. So this leads to barley in the food market being diverse in composition and ambiguous in terms of functionality. It is in our experience that one batch of food barley or barley flour may be radically different than another, such as in starch composition, kernel hardness, or flour water absorption. However, none of this information is provided to consumers or food manufacturers. Commonly, a bag of flour may just be simply labeled as barley flour with no other descriptors provided. This collectively makes barley performance unpredictable and challenging to use in food production. The lack of defined food quality for barley also makes food barley breeding programs suffer since it's unclear which traits are important for food use and whether they can be improved. Additionally, breeders and farmers need to know how genetics and environment affect food quality so they can choose varieties that perform well in a given location. Understanding the impacts of genetics and environment on barley composition and identification of key food traits are both crucial to increase the uptake of barley as a food and for breeders to improve food functionality of the crop. Uh, these challenges have led to the present research questions as an effort to improve whole grain barley foods. What we would like to know is how genetics and environment affect naked barley food traits and what is the minimum number of traits that we could use to fully characterize the overall functionality of the food barley. Uh, the materials we used to investigate these questions were grown under organic conditions. They were diverse in composition and consisted of winter and spring barleys. Uh, winter barleys are planted in the fall, then harvested in the summer of the following year. Spring barleys are planted in the spring, then harvested in the summer of that same year. And so starting with the winter barleys, I just listed all the varieties that we used. There were 15 winter barley genotypes, 12 of which had non-waxy starch, and three that had waxy starch. The winter barleys were grown in Corvallis, Oregon, and Freeville, New York, and there were a total of three harvest years. As for the spring barleys, there were a total of 17 spring barley genotypes, 11 of which had non-waxy starch, six that had waxy starch. The spring barleys were grown in Corvallis, Oregon, Freeville, New York, Madison, Wisconsin, and Arlington, Wisconsin. And there were a total of three harvest years. There were some particular challenges in the spring barleys, but I'll elaborate a bit more on this later. 
And so now for the methods that we decided to use uh, while assessing all these different varieties. So the methods used to assess food quality and functionality can be divided into pre-cooking traits and cooking traits. So starting with the pre-cooking traits, uh, measuring hardness index involves measuring the amount of force needed to crush a kernel. This gives you some insight on the, on the internal structure of the grain and can be correlated with food and performance parameters. This test is routinely done in wheat as well to classify wheats as hard or soft, which some people might be familiar with. We measured protein content and beta-glucan content. Uh, we assessed flour water absorption using two different methods. Solvent retention capacity, which is known as SRC, involves mixing a flour sample with water, letting the flour hydrate for 20 minutes uh, before measuring how much water was actually absorbed by the flour sample. This test is routinely done in wheat as well to predict end product quality and ensure consistency in a blend of flours. But SRC isn't well studied in barley, but it could prove to be useful. The second method we, uh, we used to assess flour water absorption was batter flow. So I have it pictured here. This is a, a Boswick consistometer, which is needed to measure batter flow. Batter flow involves mixing flour and water together to form a batter, allowing that batter to sit for 20 minutes, then loading the batter into the reservoir of the Boswick. A gate is then released, which causes the batter to flow, and you measure how far the batter traveled in 30 seconds. The picture on the right shows an example of three barley batters with varying batter flow distances, as well as some differences in batter color. Flower samples that absorb a lot of water have short batter flows and vice versa. This test in particular is useful for getting a quick glance and how different varieties of grain absorb water. And so now for the cooking traits, uh, starch pasting parameters, which consisted of peak viscosity, uh, breakdown, and peak time, were measured with a rapid visco analyzer, which is known as RVA. And so this is what a RVA unit looks like. And the canisters you load samples in are on the bottom left of the image. Uh, so essentially, you, uh, you load a canister with barley flour and water, then you insert the stirrer which is that paddle, paddle looking object on the bottom left of the image. Uh, you then load this canister beneath the blue object on the RVA unit. Then a cooking program begins where you can control the temperature and time at various points in the process, as well as the speed of the, that rotating paddle. This RVA cooking program shows you the cooking properties of your flour and can be used to determine the starch type of your sample and whether there is any pre-harvest sprouting in your sample. Pre-harvest sprouting is a particular concern in grains that results in excessive amounts of a starch digesting enzyme. And this could effectively like, ruin your product if you're using sprouted flour. And pre-harvest sprouting occurs when grains are exposed to high moisture conditions in the field, resulting in the grain sprouting and producing enzymes before they're being harvested. This is particular particularly problematic for making food products. So I'll talk a, a bit more about this later on. And now for the cooking traits, uh, whole grains were cooked in excess water in a pot to measure cooked grain yield and to assess cooked whole grain texture. Uh, and that was using a texture analyzer, which I have uh, pictured here. Um, here is the texture analyzer with the, where the load cell has been filled with a cooked barley sample. And then the probe, the probe just above the barley then slowly descends and crushes the barley. And that's what measures how soft or how hard the cooked texture is. And so moving on to some of the main findings. So what we found. Okay, so this is a figure from it's called principal component analysis, known as PCA. I won't go in depth here for this presentation, but what PCA essentially is showing us here is a visual rep representation of how individual barleys are different from one another based on how they performed on the methods that I just discussed. So each data point is a barley sample. Uh, that I analyze, and you can see visually how they compare to each other by how close each point is to one another. Points that are close to each other had similar qualities and performance, 
while points that are far from one another are barleys that had very different qualities. Another benefit of using PCA was that I could identify which traits were the most important for characterizing barley. So we initially began with the 10 traits that I just previously discussed, but through PCA, I could narrow it down to just six traits that explained most of the variability in the barley. The six remaining traits were batter flow, uh, RVA peak time, which is useful for determining if a barley has non-waxy or waxy starch, um, cooked grain texture, protein content, SRC, which measures the flour water absorption, and beta-glucan content. This figure also shows the individual barley varieties labeled by starch type, where the red letter A represents genotypes with non-waxy starch, while the blue letter B represents the waxy genotypes. Uh, you can see the waxy genotypes were mostly clustered in that lower right quadrant, which highlights the importance of starch type on overall food functionality. Waxy genotypes had generally higher beta-glucan content and higher flour water absorption, as indicated by larger SRCs and shorter batter flows. Uh, waxy barley also tended to have softer to intermediate cook textures. Non-waxy genotypes had generally lower amounts of beta-glucan and lower flour water absorptions. Some varieties of the non-waxy barleys also had harder cooked textures compared to the waxy barleys. These harder textured barleys typically also had higher protein contents and higher flour water absorptions. Uh, these remaining six traits are also practically relevant uh, to breeders and to the food market because they encompass two traits that are key components of barley, one being beta-glucan, which is largely influenced by variety, and the other being protein, which is largely influenced by environment. Another two traits are SRC and batter flow, which represent two ways of assessing flour water absorption uh, and can pro provide some flexibility based on available lab equipment since batter flow um, requests some less lab equipment. Uh, the last two are cooking traits that consist of cook texture and a starch pacing parameter that is useful for determining starch type. And then now moving on to the spring barleys. Uh, PCA was performed on the spring data just as it was on the winter data and it revealed a very similar pattern. The six remaining traits that explained most of the variability in the winter data were the same six traits found in the spring data. Uh, waxy genotypes showed the same clustering behavior in that lower right quadrant again, as seen before in the winter data. Uh, one unique feature of the spring barleys was that there were per, uh, black and purple varieties uh, within the spring trial. And some of these colored varieties ended up having the hardest cook textures out of all the barley, both in winter and spring. And then also, so lastly, some additional challenges also presented themselves during our research that will continue to be important for, for the future. Uh, one of which is covered smut, as shown in the top image on the head of barley. We lost all of the Corvallis Spring 2019 data because the smut was so bad that we couldn't analyze any of the grain. Breeding for smut resistance in organic barley is an ongoing effort and will need to be addressed if organic barley is going to have a larger presence in the food market. Another challenge that presented itself was pre-harvest sprouting. Uh, here's an example of what pre-harvest sprouting can do in that bottom image. These are two different samples after the RVA cooking program. The sample on top used flour that wasn't sprouted while the sample below contains sprouted flour. The starch digest digesting enzymes present in the sprouted flour uh, just completely liquefied the sample, which is highly problematic if you're trying to develop a food product using that barley flour. Like, I even like imagine just mixing a dough, even if it was mixed with wheat that you incorporated sprouted barley, the dough, and you just watch it start liquefying over time. Like that's going to be incredibly frustrating to, to happen. It's going to be like unmanageable if, it, if the sprouting is that bad. Uh, and here's a closer look at where the pre-harvest sprouting was actually occurring in the spring barleys. Corvallis had no sprouting, 
But as you move towards the eastern half of the country, incidents of sprouting increased with Arlington, Wisconsin having 55% of the total samples being sprouted. This geographical distribution of sprouting is indicative of the rainier summers in the eastern states, which happens to coincide with the harvest of spring barley. While sprouting did occur every year, the vast majority was concentrated in 2018, with the Wisconsin locations being the most affected that year. While these numerous challenges were unfortunate, the abundance of pre-harvest sprouting in the eastern states highlights highlighted a need for breeding sprouting resistance and the future varieties, as well as the importance of selecting suitable growing locations that are not prone to summer rains when the spring barley is harvested. And so ge to generally conclude on our findings, um, all 10 traits were significantly influenced by genotype and environment. Genotype was significant for all 10 traits in both the winter and spring trials, but was only consistently the largest influence for beta-glucan content and RVA peak time, which are traits both related to starch type. So when genotype was not the largest influence on a trait, environmental factor like location or year or an interaction was the largest influence. As for the traits that explain most of the variability in the barley, we identified six traits that can effectively characterize food barley, and these results were consistent in the winter and spring barleys. Furthermore, the PCA showed four main patterns in the barley we studied. There was non-waxy low-protein barley, non-waxy high-protein barley that typically had harder cooked textures, waxy barley that had high beta-glucan and high water absorption, and lastly, colored barleys that had hard cooked textures. And so while the excessive amounts of pre-harvest sprouting made the spring trial particularly challenging, it also highlighted the need to select for sprouting resistance. Breeders could spend all this time developing varieties with great food functionality, but if they sprout in the field, they won't, then they won't find their way into the food market in the first place. So resistance to sprouting needs to be targeted. In addition, the future path of this research involves linking these traits to end uses beyond just cooked whole grains. It would be great to do this again, to see how these traits relate to other end uses, such as breads and pastries, noodles, and batter-based products like pancakes. It would ultimately be useful if these traits could be used to predict a barley variety's performance in a diverse range of food products with the goal of creating delicious whole grain barley foods to benefit public health. Besides my research activities during graduate school, I was able to participate in various culinary events to promote barley as part of our outreach activities within the, that OREI grant that we were funded by. Um, so we were fortunate enough to work closely with Culinary Breeding Network and be represented at multiple events and it was at these events where I would explore different applications of whole, whole grain barley, like whole kernels or flakes, and as well as flour. And I felt like the lack of functional gluten in barley shouldn't limit its ability be, to be used in products. And so that was my main effort. And when I would go to these events, it's just highlighting the versatility of barley. And um, OSU Barley World, the research group I was part of, um, worked closely with Culinary Breeding Network and multiple collaborators to develop this barley zine that's just filled with like barley facts and all sorts of information and recipes contributed by a wide variety of people. And I'll show a link to that at the end. So here's a few pictures of random barley foods I made at these events. Um, so probably the most often, way I eat barley is like in a whole grain salad. So starting on the far left, um, this is just whole grain salads. So this is using purple and black varieties of barley that these are just boiled and then seasoned with salt and then just tossed in like with roasted vegetables, like roasted winter vegetables and pomegranate as well as like a vinaigrette. And this is like a great way to eat barley. Um, to the right, uh, right center on, on the top row is a, a barley porridge bread. I, I mentioned the porridge bread method earlier, but 
Again, cooking barley flakes into a porridge, then folding that into a developed wheat dough. You get the benefit of having an open crumb thanks to the wheat, but you get to enjoy the flavor and texture of flaked barley throughout the entire loaf. And it keeps your crumb moist for a few days longer than typical other breads. And then just below the, the bread is, um, this is hazelnut milk, but it's thickened with barley flakes. So it'd be like analogous to like oat milk you commonly see in the store. You can make barley milk as well. And so this is just blending barley flakes into a hazelnut milk and then filtering it. And it has like the texture of like, like half and half, it's really creamy. And then to the top right are tortillas made out of just 100% barley. So this involves nixtamalizing whole grain barley. This is specifically a purple variety called Karma. And so you nixtamalize it. And so this is the same process that they use um, to nixtamalize corn to make fresh masa. So I just follow the same process that they use in corn, but did it in barley. And it makes really delicious tortillas. Um, it, it has a flavor reminiscent of fresh masa. And the benefit of this by nixtamalizing it, you can actually create 100% um, barley dough that actually holds its shape and you can like shape it, which is totally unique compared to just handling barley flour. And below that are chocolate chip and sea salt cookies. And these are made from, this is all um, whole grain barley flour as well as barley flakes. And so there's no wheat in this. And in my experience, making cookies with barley flour is probably the easier of the flour applications, just because you're not relying on gluten at all for these. And yeah, I think they're way more delicious than any cookie I've had made with like pastry flour all purpose. And then some other foods. So starting on the left, this is tempeh. Um, this is made with chickpea and purple barley, a variety called karma. Um, so yeah, I ferment this with a tempeh and then I fold barley in and it has like a great texture, it's just different than you normally see in any other tempeh. And then that picture in the center on the top is a cooked version of the tempeh that was served at the 2020 Variety Showcase hosted by Culinary Breeding Network. And that was also served with tamari that was made from chickpeas and barley as well. So just using barley in like as many ways as I could possibly think of. And then just below that, are soybeans that have been covered in roasted cracked barley. And then this mixture is fermented into soy sauce. Soy sauce typically has wheat in it, but I just substituted with barley and like there's like there's no difference. It's just it makes it's just a great flavor. And then the top right are two style of misos. And um, miso you typically have soybeans, but instead of that, I used stale uh, porridge bread, barley porridge bread, and just fermented that like a miso. And it just makes something like completely different. Uh, it just gets like super sweet and like caramely and chocolatey. And then to make these types of fermented foods like soy sauce and miso, you need to use a mold. Uh, it's known as koji, which is pictured on that bottom right, that, that mold just covering barley. So yeah, that's koji. And that's how you make misos and soy sauces. And so really the purpose of all this is just to demonstrate the versatility of barley. You don't need to rely on gluten to really make delicious barley containing foods. And yeah, barley just has the potential to be so much more than the pearled barley people occasionally throw into stews. And so lastly, um, I just have so many people to thank for the help they provided for this research. So thank you to my advisors, Dr. Ross and Dr. Mainz and Dr. Hayes for their support. And thanks to our plant breeding collaborators from University of Wisconsin-Madison, Cornell, University of Minnesota, and UC Davis, and the many people part of those research teams. This research wouldn't have been possible without all of your work. And thank you to our funding source from the USDA for supporting all of this research to improve organic agriculture as a whole. Thank you to everyone from the OSU Barley World Research Group for your support in this research. 
And you can find out more about the project Farley World is involved in on their website at that link I have shown there. And thank you to Lane from the Culinary Breeding Network for creating all these awesome events where I got to cook out and highlight the uses of barley. Uh, there's a section on our website on Barley World at that uh, link shown. And this is where you can find a copy of the barley uh, zine for a collection of information on barley and uh, various recipes from a lot of talented people. And lastly, lastly, thank you to eOrganic and Alice for organizing this talk and giving me the opportunity to talk to you all. And so with all that said, are there any questions or comments? Thank you, Jordan. That was great. Um, and I don't know if anybody else is getting as hungry as I am looking at the pictures of all those good foods. Um, if you have a question, feel free to just type it into the Q&A box on your um, Zoom control panel, and we'll be reading them out loud as for as many questions as we have. Um, how does the nutritional quality of pearled barley compare to that of naked barley? Yeah, so pearl barley, you're essentially losing all this bran, and then this germ tends to fracture off as well during pearling. It's, like, it's an aggressive process. You're just like, you're ripping off those outer layers. And so you lose the bran and the germ, typically the germ. And then so you lose the nutrients concentrated in those layers. And so more specifically, it's pretty much this top section. You're losing a lot of the B vitamins and the, the vitamin E as well in the germ. And you're going to be losing a lot of additional phytochemicals like the like anthocyanins that make barley purple. So the stuff with antioxidant activity, you'll, you'll be losing that as well. Uh, you'll be losing the fat because that's concentrated in the germ. But the you're also losing like insoluble fiber like cellulose and lignin, which it's, it's more fiber like it's good to have. And so you're losing all those outer layers. Um, but I wouldn't say you're losing all the fiber in barley because barley is unique in that it actually contains fiber throughout the entire kernel. So you're still getting all the fiber. I wouldn't, it's, it's not worth stressing about if you have to eat pearled barley instead of naked barley, like you're still getting a lot of fiber, but it's mostly the micronutrients that uh, you are losing. Okay. I hope that is sufficient. Yeah, yeah, okay. no, it definitely makes me want to, eat more naked barley. I mean, I think naked barley takes longer to cook in my experience. Yes. But, um, yeah. You know, if you could soak it in advance, right? Is that? Yeah, you, you can soak it. Mm -hmm. And I mean, pearl barley, I think like the one benefit pearl barley has is that um, because you ripped off those outer layers, the starch is exposed. And so it actually is great for thickening soups to give it like a creamy mouthfeel. You, you couldn't really do that with naked barley because the starch isn't really actively exposed like pearl barley is. So it's like the one benefit I think pearl barley actually has is thickening. Okay, great, thank you. Um, have you studied traditional culinary and cultural uses around the world, such as in Syria, Tibet, and Japan? I mean, uh, studied is like a, I haven't devoted like a significant amount of time, but yes, like I have read on, like when I was, when I first started this research, like I don't, I don't think I ever even ate barley before I started working in this lab. And so I was looking at, okay, how do other cultures eat this barley? And so I was learning about different like ancient or uh, there's like Sampa in Tibet, where I believe it's like tea and butter and uh, barley just like rolled up into this ball. I've never actually personally had it, but I was being more exposed to all these other foods and like growing koji, like that mold on the barley. I learned that just by reading about how Japan used barley because there is barley miso. And so I, that's where I learned about that by studying other cultures. Um, but yeah, I try to expose myself to that stuff, but I mean, there's just, there's so much. Oh, that sounds really interesting. Um, I know, let's see, I grow a, a number of old barleys. Um, Jim here has a comment. Um, how can I tell if they have waxy or non-waxy starch? Uh, yeah, so it really comes down to having a lab, I think. Just, I, was, I was using RVA 
specifically to diagnose it. There might be some other methods that maybe are more a little bit low tech, but nothing comes to mind. I, and, unless you know, unless you know the genetics of it, usually the starch type is tracked by breeders because it is a it's like a known trait and a good way of breeding high beta glucans barley is to target waxy starch. So if if you have access to the information provided by breeders, um, that might be the easiest way to get it without sending it to a lab. But the ultimate way is to actually testing it in a lab. Because in my experience, sometimes something might be labeled as boxy starch, but that might not be the case. I have seen that happen. Yeah, I guess I'm just wondering if they could contact someone at OSU um, to find out, you know, just from compare it to the results of the projects and the research. That if it happens to done. be a variety I analyze, I can mm -hmm. tell them. But mm -hmm. um, yeah, I guess with a request like that, I would have to refer them to Bridget or Pat. Okay. Um, let's see. Um, okay, here's a comment from James um, Henderson. If anyone is interested, Oregon Grain and Bean has extensive nutritional analysis of two consecutive crop years for Tibet 37. These are very expensive tests, but um, they are yeah. willing to share with whoever is interested. So um, thank you for that. That was James Henderson of Hummingbird Wholesale. Yeah, that's great. I mean, nutritional analysis is expensive. If you can share the results, like I would take advantage of that. Thank you. Um, let's see, would post harvest, okay, oh yeah, this is a question about sprouting. Um, wouldn't post harvest sprouting improve the flavor? I know you talked about the textural problems of post harvest yeah. sprouting. Uh, yeah, so sprouting is one of those things. It's good when you want it to happen, it's bad when you don't. Uh, so yeah, sprouting, you could generate uh, some more sugars that way, like the starch will be converted to sugar through sprouting. And so that like that is a good taste. And especially if you like toasted it or something, it's gonna bring out more like granola like flavors. And so that is very good. And so if like that's your goal, that's good. but if your goal is to develop a barley bread with a, a long fermentation time and you add sprouted flour into that, if you add too much, you might just have a soupy mess and you might have to trash it or just create a bread that might not be that great. And so in that context, it's bad. So yeah, that it, picture. It, it, it's, <laughs> yeah it, it, it depends on what your goal is. And so more from like a commercial, like large scale point of view, sprouting is typically bad because this is going to cause a lot of problems in production. But if you're more on a small scale and just willing to mess around with sprouted flour, like do it. Because it does suck having to throw away sprouted grain. Like you can, you can definitely eat it. It's great. It's just from a commercial point of view, it's going to cause a lot of problems. Yeah, that picture was really convincing of why you wouldn't watch. <laughs> yeah, it liquefies it. Yeah. That was a bad example. That's not, it, it, there's a spectrum of sprouting. It could be a little bit, it could be intermediate, or it could be bad, where you just get liquid. That's like an, an exaggerated example to show what could be possible. Okay, yeah, here's another comment from James um, that OMIC laboratory um, in Portland can test for the starch type. So um, thanks for that comment as well. Um, let's see, um, here's a question about whether naked barley is more susceptible to sprouting than hulled barley. Than hulled. It's a... It's a good question. Maybe Bridget I could, could chime in here. Um, yeah. yeah. I could see. see that being plausible. Um, but even within naked barley, there's a spectrum of sprouting resistance. Um, some barleys are much more susceptible, even though like they're all naked. It's just this wide spectrum. So even I think 
even hold versus naked, I still there's, I think there's going to be some variance within that. Okay, and are the yields very different between the two? Uh, that I don't really know. That I would defer to Barley or to Bridget or Pat. Okay, yeah, Bridget or Pat. Feel but free to chime in. But even the that, it, it varies on the on the variety, and just the way Barley. I guess the yield is calculated because you are missing the hole on naked barley. So since you're missing that part, you're going to be missing that fraction. And so you're going to, it's a, I guess it's a bit more complicated to do direct comparisons because the numbers need some context. Okay, yeah, Bridget did chime in here. Um, she said that pre-sprouting is related to dormancy, which is often bred out of color covered barleys for malting. So naked versus covered should not necessarily indicate whether something will sprout or not. And in fact, covered barleys may be more susceptible to pre-harvest sprouting because of the breeding. So yeah, yeah. Um, that was Bridget Mainz, who um, with Pat Hayes is um, running various barley projects, including the multi-use naked barley one. So thank you for adding that. Um, here's another comment. Um, this one's from Andrew Ross, um, who um, Jordan was working with. Um, alkali was commonly used to extract cell wall polysaccharides from grains before the use of enzymes in lab analyses. So I think mm. the cohesion of the barley masa might be because of a greater abundance of BG in the liquid phase of the dough. Just a thought that came to me when you were talking about nixtamol. Um, and um, then he had another comment that said that iodine staining can be used for identifying oh, yes. waxy or not. Oh, thanks for that comment. Yeah, or that's a much more low tech way, the iodine stain. Yeah, or cook the flour up and let it cool. And if it cools to a rigid gel, it is not waxy. Yes. Okay. Yeah, that's an even better one, too. Um, okay. Yeah, like the non waxy ones. I always think of polenta. Like if I cook polenta and let it cool, it always forms this like you can make like a hockey puck, like perfect, just like perfect sidewalls and everything. And then so that to me always reminds me of non waxy. If you did that with a waxy barley, like cook it, let it cool, it won't be like it was this nice hockey puck looking, a standing gel. It's always kind of like creamy looking. Okay, yeah, that was really helpful. Um, okay, another comment about how yields really vary um, between varieties. Um, for example, um, yeah, this was from James again. He said that karma yield is typically 1,400 pounds per acre and Tibetan 37 is typically 3,500 pounds per acre. And we have another comment from Pat here that says that they're high yielding covered and naked types. And in theory, covered will yield 12% more due to the weight of the hull. Yeah. Yeah, and then James also said that streaker is often over 6,000 pounds per acre and havener can be as high as 9,000 pounds per acre. So yeah, thanks for all those. Yeah, it, there's here. a lot of variability in the variety. It's hard to make direct comparisons between naked versus covered. There's always some other nuance to it. Yeah, Bridget commented again. She said that um, the hull accounts for 10 to 13 percent of the weight and volume of the grain, so naked types do tend to yield less. Um, additionally, there's been significantly less breeding work done on naked barley, so yields tend to be lower. However, as we work on breeding for yield in naked barley, we do see the potential for high yielding naked barley. And the test weight, a measurement of volume for naked barley, is more similar to wheat at about 60 pounds um, per I guess, is that bushel? I'm not that um, knowledgeable here, rather than the typical 48, yep, yeah, bushel, <laughs> 48 pounds per bushel standard for covered barley. So yeah, thanks for all those great comments, Bridget. Let me just look and see if anybody else has any questions. We still have a little bit of time. So if you do have a question, feel free to type it in. I'm just going backward here, scrolling up. Jordan, if you see any other questions that need to be addressed. Uh -huh. No, I think. Let's see. I think we've. That's for all the ones I saw. 
Okay. Um, oh yeah, here's a comment right. though. I missed this one from Hans. Um, he said he usually makes a porridge with a variety of seeds and grains, fresh ground, combining an oil seed with starchy balances, dusty and gumming in the milling. Not quite sure what all that means, but it sounds uh, like he makes a good part porridge with a variety of seeds and grains. Yeah, I'm not seeing that yeah. comment. Okay, yeah, it's pretty far up there. Um, let's see. Okay, so I had another question about whether work is being done to reduce the sprouting effect of barley. It sounds as though that is being done. Do you want to make more comments uh, about that? Yeah, I mean, that it's just an ongoing effort. I can't really comment on any specifics. It's just something that it needs to be considered in future trials. So there is work being done. I just can't really elaborate on any more specifics than that. Okay, sounds good. Well, it looks like we've come to the end of the questions here. So I'd like to thank everyone for all these great questions and comments. Really nice when we have a good, engaged, interactive audience here. And thank you so much, Jordan, for this really informative and interesting presentation. It's great to hear about all the experiments that you were doing with Naked Barley. And um, yeah, thanks everyone for joining us today. And um, you're welcome to attend any future webinars that we have on Naked Barley or any of the other organic farming research topics that we have. So thanks again. All right. Thank you, everyone. Bye. All right. Bye.